Okay, we'll uh, get it started for tonight. I've got a few people online, so it looks like we're all ready to go. So, um, welcome everybody, uh, and thank you for dialing in tonight. I think this is the uh, sixth state of play for 2021. Um, for all of you on Zoom, uh, you may see a notification about the meeting being recorded. Please just click OK or agree to continue. And firstly, an acknowledgement of country. So in the uh, spirit of reconciliation, MND Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aborigine and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people on whose land I am, and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emergent emerging and extend a welcome to any Aborigine and Torres Strait Islander peoples on the call today. So today we're going to hear about some research trying to identify some of the factors underlying the, the very individual nature of MND presentation in each patient. Each patient. Uh, Professor Pam McComb from the University of Queensland and the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital will tell us about her research into disease variability and uh, Dr. Thomas Shaw, who's actually in the Faculty of Engineering, Architecture and Information Technology at the University of Queensland, will tell us about how he's been using advanced imaging techniques to characterise disease in different patients. Um, Tom was also awarded a Bill Gold Fellowship last year as well. Um, as previously, each presenter will talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have a combined Q&A se session at the end of, end of the uh, session. And uh, if you have questions, please submit them through the chat or Q&A function in Zoom or through the comments if you're coming in to us uh, through Facebook. So uh, I believe, Pam, you're taking it away tonight. So please, um, it's all yours. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be able to um, speak. Um, this is really more of a literature review of, of our thoughts about heterogeneity. It, it's what was put into a very large review paper that we, we published just last year, trying to get a grips with, with heterogeneity, which has said, it's really important in, in how we go forward with, with MND research. So I work at the MND clinic with Rob Henderson, and we say this to each other all the time. Everybody's different. Every patient is different. MND patients are individuals, and they bring their personality and life history to their experience of living with MND. And that, that is surely true. But what I'm going to talk now about is the kind of biological heterogeneity and, and how we need to drill down on that to particularly move, move into therapeutics for motor neuron disease. So th this is kind of the, the background. So now I see a patient and I examine them and I find out what the signs are and do some tests. And I see if, if what that patient has matches with a disease that I've been taught about, it's in the textbook. So in the textbook, I can open a chapter and it tells me what ALS or MND is like. But of course, someone had to write those textbooks. Someone needed to figure out that, that there was a disease called ALS. And all this happened back in the 1800s, which was the great time of classification. This is when the species were classified. This is when people talked about evolution. So, so, so in the 1800s, the physicians of the day who didn't have the tests that we have these days were able to see a patient, then see another patient and maybe see another patient. Usually it wasn't huge numbers. And then they would say, I think all those patients are the same. And and they would give it, you know, either a name, which was, you know, Joe Blog syndrome, or they would give a descriptive name, such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And the beginning of it really was physicians, observant physicians, noticing that patients had similarities and putting them in groups 
and labeling those groups with a name that became the cause of the disease. And so that was a huge advance to be able to classify patients into diseases. And it allowed then the investigation of what would be the cause of disease in this group of patients. And you, you, you might have people you know, with pneumonia be able to figure out what caused their pneumonia. So it was a huge breakthrough. And then once you had a disease and you thought you knew what its treatment was, then you could say, okay, let's try to treat it. We'll give all the patients with what we've called this disease, this treatment, and see whether it works. But of course, we've always known that we need large groups of patients to study because people vary, because people maybe don't vary in the disease, but they vary in their other, other aspects. So some people are tall, some people are short, some people are men, some people are women, some people are old, some people are young. So even people who have the same disease have a lot of variability about themselves. So that's why we've always known that we need large groups of people, particularly when we do trials, but really when we do any research, so that we hope that the differences will all balance out. So just to reiterate that MND or ALS was first recognised by Charcot, who's the, the chap here in the purple jacket, and he made this really important observation that it was a combination of upper motor neuron signs and lower motor neuron signs. Before him, there had been other people who recognised that there were diseases when patients became weak and the weakness got worse as time went on. The early um, men, because they were all men, um, initially didn't know whether it was people were weak because it was a problem with the nerves or with the muscles and they didn't understand the difference between upper and lower motor neuron signs. But that's what Charcot figured out. And of course, upper motor neuron signs result from disease in the brain where the upper motor neurons are found and the lower motor neuron signs are from disease in the, the bulbar and spinal regions where the lower motor neurons live. So that's fair enough, that's unequivocal. That's how we define motor neuron disease people who have a combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs. And there are um, criteria we use to diagnose MND, all of which really are based on that combination. And I guess I've got ahead of myself there. So, so it is possible to define MND. There are diagnostic criteria, but there are also similar diseases that are, you know, look very similar but are not motor neuron disease. And, and um, PLS, progressive lateral sclerosis is one. Spinal muscular atrophy is another one. That's a disease of children. And the first PLS is a disease purely of upper motor neurons and spinal muscular atrophy is purely a disease of lower motor neurons. And in, in diagnosis of ALS, sometimes at the beginning, we're not sure whether a patient truly has both upper and lower motor neurons. Sometimes it takes time for, for the signs to fully evolve. So that, 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 those are the diseases which are similar to MND, but don't fit into the boundaries of MND. But of course, the boundaries of MND are a bit elastic. And we know, all of us know, that some patients with motor neuron disease have frontotemporal dementia. Some people have frontotemporal dementia without motor neuron disease, so there's overlap. But there's also overlap sometimes with Parkinson's disease. So even in patients who fulfill the criteria for MND, upper and lower motor neuron, there can be some other things going on that, that make it difficult for us to know where to put the boundaries of the disease. And the last point I've made there is that this is well so shown with genetic studies and um, recently, there have been very large genetic studies of motor neuron disease, but also of other neurodegenerative diseases. And there are overlapping genes amongst all these neurodegenerative diseases. So, so it, we've got diagnostic criteria, but there could be overlap. But even within the group where it's clearly MND, there is heterogeneity. And I've listed these things. They seem very obvious, but they need to, accounted for, to be accounted for when we're 
doing studies and looking at results. So one is the age of onset. There are the, we, we have a database of our patients and the youngest age of onset in our list was 17 years. So, so onset can be very young, but it also can be very old. And with a neurodegenerative disease, you might expect that, that the age of onset or that more people would get it with aging. It's not quite like that. It declines in very late age, but certainly there's the age of onset. And obviously um, as you age, there are physiological changes. So we might expect things to work out differently for young people versus old people. There's clear um, differences in the sex of the patient. And MND is more common in men than in women. But in older age groups, we see another peak coming along of women with bulbar motor neurone disease. We don't fully understand that, but there are clearly differences according to the sex of the patient. For all of you out there, the, the site of onset clearly is highly variable. Um, some people start with weakness of talking. Other people might be weakness of the lower limbs or the upper limbs, but sometimes we see people whose initial site of onset is in the breathing muscles or or in the, the trunk so that they can't hold their spine straight. And we just don't know why the disease starts where it does and whether we should put people with bulbar onset always in the same category as people with limb onset. And some very recent work we've done is starting to maybe even show some biomarker differences between bulbar onset and limb onset. So when we do clinical trials, it's very important at least to have the same proportion of people with bulbar and limb in each group, and probably important to analyze separately the different groups. Now, the next one is a bit complicated. There are people who have what we call typical ALS who fulfill the upper and lower motor neuron criteria, but there are some people who, who have both, but maybe it's a bit more one than the other. So people with predominance of upper or lower motor neuron, we can identify, it's rare, maybe 10%. And people with those kind of features actually have a slower rate of progression. Very obviously, some people have a family history and some people do not. In the people who have a familial disease, sometimes we can identify the gene and there are you know, 40 or so different genes. People vary according to where there's whether there's weight loss, and sometimes weight loss is very pronounced, and the patient, by the time they come to us, has already been to a gastroenterologist for investigation of weight loss. People vary in the rate of progression of disease. Now, I've said down the bottom, all of this does cause difficulty with clinical trials. So that's why, A, we need big numbers, and B, we need to randomise it so that the differences all even out between any two groups. So those are some of the elements of the heterogeneity that we can easily see in the clinic. And just briefly, the, the, the paper I'm referring to was a review looking at the effects of all of the heterogeneity on survival. And these are just a few um, top level things to note. So people with older onset have shorter survival, which I think is a little bit intuitive that, that as you're older, um, you, you might expect that survival might, might be shorter because of the way chromosomes work. Females have shorter survival. Limb onset has longer survival. Weight loss at onset has shorter survival. And as I mentioned, typical ALS has shorter survival. Now I want to emphasize that this is overall statistics. Clearly, even within each of those groups, there's a very wide range of um, outcome and rates of progression. So none of this applies to individuals. So now I want to talk about the different causative genes. So as, as you all know, there are many genes. And what we'd like to know is whether people with a specific gene have their own particular specific trajectory of disease and should be kept apart from other, other people with motor neuron disease. This is still kind of being clarified, but there are some genes that cause fairly rapid course of disease, but it's, it is very complicated because the SOD1 gene, which was the first gene that was identified in ALS, 
has many, many, many different variants. And the different variants themselves have a different rate of progression. But even beyond that, Rob and I very famously have um, a brother and a sister where they both had the identical SOD1 mutation and one had a very typical life expectancy and the other lived for more than 10 years. So, so we, we're starting to see that maybe genes do affect survival, but it's complicated and something else is also going on. Now the environment. We, we can't forget the environment. It's hard for us to get a handle on. The genes are a bit easier for us. We can get the DNA and, and, and look, look at DNA fairly readily. The environmental factors that, that a person has been exposed to are a bit harder for us to get a handle on. But as you all know, environmental factors can predispose to motor neuron disease. And the kinds of things we're talking about are toxins like the very famous cycads in, in Guam, but also occupational exposures to things like formaldehyde. And if MND, as we think it is, is a multi-stage process where a number of different things have to happen, people clearly can vary in their exposures and those exposures um, could influence the rate of progression of disease, but more importantly, could also potentially be modified. Now, this is a graph that I took from um, the review that we wrote. And we were interested to know whether there would be variation around the world in survival. So this is the median survival. And once again, this is an average. Many people live longer or shorter than these median survivals. But you can see it right in the middle. It's come out as a sort of a gray color, but in the very middle sort of Scotland, England, France, you can see the survival through there seems to be a bit less than perhaps the survival over more in the Asian countries. Now that's a very complicated thing to understand. It could be genetics because obviously populations vary in their genetics. It could be environment because all the countries have their own um, diet and, and other occupational exposures. It's probably not due to variation in treatment because we're still seeking a treatment. So it was interesting when we lined them up like that. You, you can't help taking away the suggestion that, that the European countries um, perhaps have, have a lesser survival. But as I said, even if that's true, that you could speculate on a large number of possible causes. So this was a bit of a graph trying then to think a bit more deeply about the processes involved in, in ALS to see how there would be variability that would affect survival. Now I'm going into these in a bit more detail, but we know that the immune system has a role in motor neuron disease. There, there are some immune cells at the site of pathology around the, in the spinal cord and motor cortex. And I'll talk a little bit about how that might be variable and might, might affect the, the, the variability of the disease. Because the immune system is very complicated and all of the immune molecules and cells have a very complicated range of genetics behind them. So there's huge scope for vari variability. We know that metabolism is important in disease. We've known for a long time that um, being a bit Fatter is better than being a bit thinner and that people who have a very active metabolism called hypermetabolism have, have a worse prognosis than those without. The yellow circle down the bottom, I'll talk about all these a little bit more, but that's a concept called, called disease spread. Now we know, you all know that the disease starts maybe in a lower limb and then it spreads to other regions, maybe to the upper limb, to the other lower limb, to the bulbar function. So the disease has to spread. And how the disease spread is, is not, again, everything I'm saying, I'm afraid is not fully understood, but it's not fully understood. But it most likely occurs by the, the sharing of protein from one nerve cell to a neighboring nerve cell. 
And that process requires mechanisms to get the protein out and into the other cell. And all those mechanisms could potentially vary. And you can imagine that somebody might have a, a you know, a better way of spreading the disease for, or the protein from cell to cell. So there's certainly scope for variability there. We know that muscle is important in disease and people vary highly in the, the way the muscle responds to MND. And the green blob is called motor neuron cell death. So we, we have a range of possible things that can cause MND, for example, excitotoxicity or accumulation of proteins or dysfunction of the mitochondria. But at the end of that, there are processes that cause the cell to die. And that also can vary. So I might just flick through the next few slides of this. Okay. So the first one is the immune system. Now this is very oversimplified, but the important cell here is called the Treg cell. That's a regulatory T cell. It's very important in immunology and damping down immune responses, but it's also very important in healing of tissue. So if there's tissue damage and a Treg cell gets into the tissue, it pours forth, um, growth factors that, that can cause healing. And, and this, this is something that's really important in all, all diseases, but all neurological diseases. So Tregs help recovery from stroke, Tregs help recovery um, from spinal cord injury. We know that on the whole Treg cells are defective in motor neuron disease, but people who have a higher level have a better outcome. So, so we don't know why people vary in their immune response in the Treg cells, but if we can understand that, that's another little piece of the puzzle as to why people vary. Just to mention to you, there are many other aspects of the immune system, particularly activation of complement and, and activation of cytokines, all of which can vary because the immune system um, has a lot of genes that control all of these molecules. Now, metabolism, um, as I've said, hypermetabolism is associated with a worse outcome. So people um, who, who lose, lose a lot of weight early on have a worse outcome and low body mass index is associated with a worse outcome. It's not, um, again, it's not fully understood why some people have hypermetabolism and others don't, but that's another source of variability in the outcome and progression of disease. Now the disease spread I've already mentioned. So disease spreads from region to region, by which I mean it might spread from the bulba region to the upper limb region to the lower limb region. And it is thought to be associated with the spread of these toxic proteins, which are thought to be like prions, which are, which are these abnormal toxic proteins that are involved in some forms of dementia. And there does seem to be a mechanism by which the protein can get out of one cell and into the other cell, and that requires cellular mechanisms, all of which can also vary. So, it, so the, um, our genes are highly variable, and there's variability in every protein and every, every function that's in physiology, all of which could vary and, and, and be reflected in elements of MND. Now the motor neuron cell death, I've already touched on this, but I'll just mention it again. So if we write reviews or read reviews about what causes MND, there's a section called pathogenesis, which is the section that um, suggests how, what are the processes that lead to the, to the pathology of the motor neurons. As I said, a lot, a lot of it is clearly related to excited toxicity because the only drug we've ever had that, that, that helps MND, Rilizol, works by stopping excitotoxicity. And there are many processes that can cause excitotoxicity. Protein aggregation is clearly very important. And the most important protein is probably TDP43. And then mitochondrial dysfunction. So the mitochondria are these elements within the cell that are responsible for energy metabolism. And when energy production fails, then the cell triggers cell death. Now, 
cell death um, has a, there, there are a number of different kinds of cell death. Necrosis is, is where the cells are killed by some toxic or being burnt or something from outside. But in diseases like motor neuron disease and, and many other diseases, there are actually processes where the cell gets triggered to commit suicide, to, to switch itself off and kill itself. And the best known of those is called apoptosis, which I'm proud, proud to say was described by John Kerr from the University of Queensland, among others. But there are also some other named causes of cell death called ferroptosis and necroptosis. And there are, there are um, enzymes involved in all of these processes and all of these enzymes are subject to genetic variability. So if we could figure out the kind of cell death and look at the genetics of that, that would explain some of the variability, but would also be another useful target for, um, for attempting therapy. I think we're near the end now. Now the gut microbiome. So you've all heard about this. It's all over the television. Use probiotics, get, get good gut health. And, and it seems to be true and it's very, very important. So the gut contains enormous numbers of bacteria and enormous numbers of different kinds of bacteria. And these bacteria can do things that are either good or bad to the host. They can produce molecules that are helpful to the immune system or harmful to the immune system. They can produce molecules that are toxic to nerve cells. They can produce molecules that interact with what's called the gut brain, which is all the nerve cells in the gut, activate these gut brain nerve cells, which can then interact with the brain. So the gut microbiome appears to be A, very important in health and B, able to vary widely. And we at UQ, as well as others, have started to look at this in motor neurone disease and have found some alterations of the gut microbiome and shown that it is related to the rate of progression of disease. But this um, requires much, much, much larger numbers of subjects to be sorted out before we can pin down exactly which, um, which microorganism is, is, is the real culprit. The next slide, I'm, I'm sorry this is all going so quickly. The next slide is another important topic called epigenetics. Now, epigenetics concerns changes to DNA. So we all inherit chromosomes containing DNA from our parents and the chromosomes code um, long molecules that, that contain code that codes for proteins. But the DNA can be changed. It can be biochemically changed. And that can be things, things like illness or starvation or hormones like estrogen or life experience. And these changes are permanent for the, for the life of the individual and could modify how genes act. And this too is also being investigated in ALS because there are drugs that can alter epigenetic changes. And this is another source of variability. But this is something that largely or very much can interact with the environment because as I mentioned, illness, diet, life experience are, are kind of external things that, that can influence epigenetics. So I've come to the end. So in conclusion, we, we need to look carefully at patients and we need to record very, very many clinical details because, you know, it's, it's all important. It's all very important. And then remember I said at the beginning, so the, the original Dr. Charcot conceived of the disease that we can recognise and define as ALS. But, but the critical thing about heterogeneity is that not what I said at the beginning, that every single person is completely individual. It is very likely that within the broad group of people with ALS, there will be some subgroups and one obvious kind of subgroup would we could put in one group all the people who have one particular disease. Another obvious subgroup is to group together all the people with bulbar onset. And when we test drugs and when we do experiments, we need 
to think about the subgroups, make sure everybody is well matched. And we certainly would never want to do a study unless it was a specifically designed study, but we wouldn't say, oh, let's try this drug, but as it's easy to get men, we'll only do it in men. That would be very foolish because women might behave differently. We wouldn't want to say, oh, we'll only get people with bulbar onset because limb onset might behave differently, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so heterogeneity is a challenge. There are many, many, many things that we can look at. We all know how complicated motor neurone disease is. But it, it, it's like a, you know, it's, it's a puzzle. The pieces are all coming together and, and we need, need to deal with heterogeneity. So that's all from me. And my job now is to introduce you to the next speaker, who is Dr. Tom Shaw, who um, is, is um, a, a scientist who, who works on imaging. I'm collaborating with him on some things that I'm finding extremely interesting. And he has a fellowship from the MD MDRA. I think it's thrilling that, that we've attracted him into MND research. And I'm looking forward to hearing what he's going to say. So thank you. Thanks, Pam. Okay. Um, just check, Pam, can you see my, my screen there okay? Okay, yep. Okay, wonderful. Um, it's the full slide, not the, the presenter view? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, it's okay, full size, everyone. Yeah, all good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> wonderful. G'day, everyone. Um, my name is Tom Shaw. Um, thanks very much for Pam. That was a great overview. Um, and I think that will sort of lead quite nicely into what I'll be talking about today, which is um, imaging motor neuron diseases. So um, what I'll be doing mostly is talking about uh, how we're going to be measuring that heter heterogeneity of the disease um, using magnetic resonance imaging um, or MRI. I'll be talking a little bit about some of my research that I've been doing um, and what we'll be doing next over the coming years in order to try and disentangle um, some of the differences between motor neuron diseases. Um, and some of and some, try and elucidate some of that um, heterogeneity that Pam was talking about before. Um, so I'd like to thank the Motor Neuron Disease Research Australia um, for giving me the fellowship. Um, I'd also just like to acknowledge um, the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering, and of course, the Centre for Advanced Imaging at UQ. Hopefully my slides will progress, great. Um, so as Pam uh, has mentioned, uh, MND does exist along a spectrum. So this is a sort of very crude um, diagram, but I like using it um, because it does represent what we're trying to talk about today um, quite nicely. Um, one minute, sorry. Oops. Um, so from what we've heard today, uh, a lot of people will have already be received a diagnosis. So many of you here today may have already received a diagnosis of, for example, ALS um, or uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or um, one of the other diagnoses along this spectrum. Um, we know that MND affects the motor neurons, which exist in both the spine and in the brain, and that there are many different common forms of MND uh, and many more rare forms, including um, like PLS, which is, doesn't fall within that category of MND, um, or PMA, um, these spinal onset um, forms that Pam was also talking about. Um, some of these are, are more slow progressing, some of these are more fast progressing. Um, so what we can see on this sort of simplified figure uh, is that um, what we would call the heterogeneity of the disease. So with motor neuron diseases affecting the lower motor neurons on the left hand side, um, up to the mo upper motor neurons on the right hand side. Um, so maybe that some people experience symptoms that are due to um, degeneration of motor neurons, um, uh, either in their brain or in their spine or in both. Um, and that might lead to different symptoms um, or result in shorter or longer survival. So uh, whereas the survivability of ALS might be three to five years, um, there are far slower progressing variants um, that can only be diagnosed after that initial five years is up. Uh, and in some cases, we even see rare forms of ALS when the survivability of the disease is greater than five years. So again, there's this, this spectrum of diseases and people living with MND um, will find themselves along this spectrum. Um, so the, that spectrum, it, it continues to, to expand and grow um, as more diagnostic criteria continue to evolve over time. Um, we know that there are both upper motor neuron dominant, lower motor neuron dominant mixed signs. Uh, and the reason for those are pretty much what Pam has just gone through. 
Um, so the thing that I'm interested in now um, is using MRI or to understand the differences between these different disease subtypes or to try and characterize the differences along the spectrum. Um, and that's kind of what my research is, is mostly interested in. Okay, so MRI, um, magnetic resonance imaging, it's been successfully used to characterize the biological tissue in the brain for many, many years. Um, I'm interested in how to measure the brain and the spine uh, with MRI and especially in MND. Um, so here in this image, this is in an MRI image. This is a microscope or a microscopy image. Um, this is a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is important for memory. Um, we can see the different staining of the hippocampus, which are the different colors. These represent different, uh, different cell types. Um, so here on the other hand, this is a, uh, an MRI image. So many of you might be familiar with these um, different MRI images. Um, we can see that there are different types of MRI images here. Um, so we don't really see that, that microstructural detail that we saw with the uh, microscopy image, but we do see more of the macro scale. Uh, and we see that very well with MR. Um, as we get to uh, better hardware, um, so what we can see here on the left um, is an image um, of our seven Tesla scanner at the Center for Advanced Imaging at UQ. Um, it may look like a relatively small machine, but that's Eamon, our head of human imaging there. Um, and he's 202 centimeters tall, I think. So he's enormous. And um, so that scanner takes up the whole room. Um, so the seven Tesla is quite a, a special machine. Um, there's only two in Australia. Um, they're 25 tons, uh, $13 million. And the, the bore where you go into it is about 2.4 meters long. So. Um, they're really great scanners because they allow us to have higher resolution, um, better images and faster imaging. So you, you wouldn't see these in a, in a clinical context. Um, they're more for research, uh, and that's what we would be using uh, to image people's brains. Um, so MR is capable of not just acquiring images, but also acquiring different contrasts of, of the same uh, tissue. So biological tissue is made up of many different things, um, but we can image those. So we can look at the spins of the water protons, uh, within uh, the image, uh, blood water, iron, other biological properties. So for example, Pam was talking about apoptosis. Um, we're able to measure the inflammation that's caused when apoptosis occurs. Um, so that's one of the other signals that we're able to acquire with MR. Um, so imagine these sequences uh, or these contrasts uh, as different scenes or, or visions of the same image. So just if we're looking at these images on the right, um, these are just different names for the, the types of scenes that we would acquire from the image, which tell us different things about the tissue. Um, so I did say that we don't really get the microstructure, but um, with more recent advancements and with the sort of 7T that we're able to uh, use at CAI, uh, it's becoming more and more possible to measure smaller structures in the brain. Um, so here we can see the peel vasculature, um, so the arterioles and venules of the brain at 160 micron resolution. Um, courtesy of Dr. Tasia Bowman and uh, Professor Marcus Bath at the Center for Advanced Imaging. Um, so the ability for us to resolve even smaller uh, images and smaller parts of tissue is, um, is kind of becoming possible now uh, as we increase the um, sort of resolution and the hardware that we're using. Um, and we're able to do that in vivo or in living tissue, um, which isn't really possible with things like microscopy. Um, so that's one of the main benefits of using MRI is that we can do it in vivo or in living tissue um, you don't need any contrast agents, so you don't need any injections or anything like that. Um, and uh, there's no ionizing radiation. So it's a, it's a fairly safe procedure, um, unlike things like x-ray, which use ionizing radiation. Um, here as well at CAI, we have a three Tesla scanner, which um, many people might be familiar with, uh, which was used mostly in clinical settings. So if you've already had a scan of your brain, um, you will have used a scanner that's more closely uh, resembling this one. Um, so you can sort of see the size difference there. Okay, um, so what can we do with MRI? Um, well, as I said, um, we have all of these different uh, sequences like this one here, uh, which map out different types of tissue. And with these different uh, tissue types and different contrasts, uh, we can pick out different things in the image. Um, so here's that, that image um, just of a, a brain using one of these different contrasts. Um, so while your neurologist and radiologist will be looking for things like shrinkage or degeneration or different signals in the scan, um, especially in regions like the motor cortex or corticospinal tracts, um, or they're looking for different signal intensities on the scan. Um, we can do a lot more than with the, the images um, by looking at the numbers that these images represent. Um, so here's a pretty rough diagram of, of what I'm talking about. But if you can imagine that each one of these pixels um, that is in the scanner 
um, or in the image that we're looking at um, represents a number. Um, and each one of these pixels lined up together um, represents a little a grid of numbers like we can see here. You can imagine that we can do some pretty complex mathematical and statistical techniques um, in order to understand what's going on within the image. Um, so while we're not exactly getting the same level of detail as you'd see in this microscope image on the left, um, we can still get a, a fairly rough idea. We can map um, different regions of the brain. So um, you could imagine that each of these numbers could uh, represent or correspond to a particular cell type. And if we're tuning our scanners to say, look for motor neurons or information that occurs during cell death, um, we can get a, a pretty good idea of the rate of progression of MND uh, and the particular location of the disease pretty non-invasively. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the, the really uh, great benefits of, of MR. Um, so one of the main considerations for MRI uh, is the variability of brain anatomy. And we're talking a lot about um, heterogeneity of diseases today. And I just wanted to sort of touch on that there's a lot of differences um, within just within MND, but also within the, the, the larger population. So people are different. Um, your fingerprints are very different, just the same as your brain print is very, very different. Um, it's difficult to measure everyone in the same way um, using MRI. You can see here that these are, these are people with uh, MND here. Um, so these are some images on the left. You can see this sort of very striking motor cortex degeneration um, where we'd expect to see some tissue there isn't um, at the very top of the image. Um, and on the right is a, another image of the spinal cord. Um, so these are some of the, the different images that we might take in order to look for um, differences in the MND patients. Um, so one of the things that I am working on at the moment um, is taking these images, which have all of this variability and heterogeneity, and extracting some meaningful biological information from them using um, those computers and computational methods that I just uh, briefly spoke about before. Um, so what I mean by that is, is we have all of this biological, this rich biological information that comes from MRI. So it's, it's not just images, it's numbers that go with it. Um, and we can explore a bit the heterogeneity by looking at numbers and making inferences between different populations and different patient groups um, and explore what makes people so different and uh, what makes MND so different between each other. So um, what makes one person different from another? Um, so I did mention uh, that MR is useful for imaging the brain. It's also useful for imaging the spine, um, which is what we'll be looking at a lot in, in some of our research. Um, so here we can see these are those different contrasts again that I was just talking about. Um, so we can see the way um, in, in this one on the left here um, that the brain and the spine are connected um, using a, a type of MR using diffusion imaging, um, which measures the flow of water diffusivity between brain cells. Um, so the colors here actually represent the direction of the flow of water. Um, so cells are connected by axons generally, and they are um, connected by in a certain direction. And that's what these different uh, uh, directions or these different colors represent is the direction of the flow. Um, we can see that the motor cortex and, um, will be connecting all the way down through corticospinal tracts down uh, into the spine here as well. Um, so we talked about MND affecting the motor system and motor neurons in the brain. Um, well, we can see how the motor cortex is connected to the spinal cord and um, the spinal motor neurons uh, down the bottom. Um, so the actual connections between motor neurons that are disrupted after the death of motor neurons can be tracked as well using this type of imaging, using uh, diffusion imaging. Um, we also know that there are similar conditions to MND that present in similar ways. So Pam was talking about FTD or frontotemporal dementia before, um, and FTD can present uh, in the frontal lobes, obviously, um, and uh, the frontal lobes at the front of the brain. Um, and so uh, the connections between these frontal lobes, um, which are responsible for things like these executive functioning, um, the connections between um, these regions are more disrupted in FTD. Um, so again, this kind of points out to the heterogeneity of the disease is that we need to, um, we need to kind of pick apart or disentangle or um, rule out the incidence of FTD when we're looking at uh, brain images. Um, and there may even be overlap, as Pam said as well. So many people present with both. Um, here in the middle, um, we can see anatomical information um, of the spine here. So this butterfly-like shape, uh, like structure here is the motor neurons of the spine, um, the cell bodies in the spinal cord. So this is where the information flows from um, the brain to the spine uh, and out to the muscles in the body. Um, and to the right, we can see the differences between uh, imaging with 7T and with 3T. So the 7 Tesla is that big um, giant magnet that I was talking about before. Um, so we can see quite nicely uh, the difference with uh, imaging at seven Tesla as opposed to imaging at three Tesla down the bottom. Um, and we can see those uh, cell bodies of the spinal cord. So this is a cross section of the spine. If you're going in this direction here, 
um, and we're looking at the, the motor neurons within the spinal cord there. Um, so one of the things that I'm very, very interested in is, is using 7Tesla um, and using these advanced imaging techniques in order to uh, get a better understanding of the differences between different people. And I think I'll bring it back to the um, this image um, that I started with um, about spectrum of MND. So, um, and how we might be going about uh, distinguishing these subtypes of motor neuron disease. So as I mentioned before, it's difficult to diagnose with any certainty the different subtypes of motor neuron disease. Uh, and as Pam mentioned before, um, people, are, uh, clinicians are taught uh, how to diagnose based on um, criteria on, in a note or in a textbook. And so what we want to do is try and uh, assist or at least try and uh, help with the, diagnose, uh, the diagnosis and to help uh, understand um, the differences between patients using MRI. And we're hoping that our work at these very small scales um, using the seven Tesla magnet will be helping and aiding with diagnosis. So our, uh, our next steps are to use what we've already learned from modeling brain anatomy and um, brain morphology and applying these to both the brain and the spine. Um, so the work I'm currently working with uh, is with Derek Stein uh, and Shu No and Rob Henderson, who many of you will already know, uh, Marcus Barth and Stefan Bowman as well. Um, and this is the BELONG study, so the biomarkers of long surviving uh, MND. And the key idea here is to incorporate um, patients with both uh, upper motor neur neuron dominant and lower motor neuron dominant um, groups to see if we can find differences uh, earlier than what we can already uh, be achieved. Um, so the reason for this is currently a diagnosis for, um, for example, PLS um, can only be made five years after disease onset uh, with no lower motor neuron um, involvement. Uh, so we think it's really important to reduce this time by developing new ways of imaging patients uh, using MRI. And by doing things like imaging the spine and imaging the brain at the same time, uh, this might be uh, possible. So we'll be measuring both brain and spine uh, with MRI at the Center for Advanced Imaging <clears throat> using a few of the methods that I talked about before and taking those numbers uh, from the scanner to enable more complex statistical techniques uh, for understanding different disease types. Um, so we'll be uh, looking at not just the structure of the spinal cord, um, we'll also be looking at quantitative markers like diffusion and also measures that uh, look at inflammation. Um, we'll then be correlating these anatomical markers with clinical scores uh, and examining how the brain and spine are related to the clinical presentation of the disease. Um, so what we really want to get to know is, is what is it like um, for each person individually and how do they change uh, and how does their presentation in MR change depending on uh, how they present in the clinic. So um, when patients come into the clinic or in the hospital, um, many people are given a clinical phenotype or a diagnosis. So for example, um, MAD has many different clinical subtypes, so ALS, PLS, um, these have different clinical presentations, but um, very similar digital presentations. So um, what we'll be doing is matching the clinical phenotype of the subgroups, um, the clinical presentation of the patient with the anatomy of the disease um, that's reflected by MRI. And we can do this by looking at the different images of both the brain and the spine and relating these to clinical presentation. Um, so we'll be looking, moving away from just examining images with the naked eye and uh, moving more data, moving towards more data-driven approaches of classifying disease subtypes, um, which may help us understand a bit more of the heterogeneity of the disease. Um, so we'll be scanning um, coming from uh, in a few months from now um, in order to sort of uh, have uh, patients from all different groups and all different, um, so all different types of motor neuron disease uh, and to sort of classify and understand a bit earlier um, the, the heterogeneity of MND. Um, and by doing this, we'll get a, a better picture of MND in, in general and hopefully expedite the diagnosis pr um, process. Um, so the research is still evolving. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge my wonderful um, uh, research team that I've been working with. So Derek, Shu, Rob, Pam, um, Stefan, Marcus, the, uh, the rest of the groups there, and especially MNDRA. Um, so thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Tom. And um, thank you, Pam. That was uh, fantastic, both of you, for one, uh, a massive overview of disease heterogeneity, and Tom taking us through some really uh, fabulous technology about how you can really get into the nuts and bolts of um, trying to uh, identify that heterogeneity. Um, got a few questions out there. So one of the questions that has come up is about 
obviously I think you briefly mentioned it, Pam Sport. I know there's been a lot of elite sportsmen who've, uh, or a few elite sportsmen who've developed MND and there's, that theory's been around. Have there been studied, more generalised studies on sort of physical activity rather than perhaps just focusing on the um, absolute elite sportsmen? Yeah. Look, as you know, it's, it's very difficult. And um, there's a concept called reverse causation, okay? So, so maybe more sports people get MND, but maybe the fact that the genes that make them good sports people made them vulnerable to get MND. So, so we just don't quite know which way around it might be. The genes for athleticism might, might be genes that modify um, MND. When, when we're asked this question, I, I think the most important answer that I give to patients is that we have no evidence at all that doing some exercise once you've got MND will do you any harm. It's okay to exercise. And I think, you know, while there were the Italian soccer players and there was Lou Gehrig, we, we don't necessarily think it was the activity. It might have been the athleticism and the genes that made them good sports people in the first place. So that's the best answer I can give. Thank you, Pam. Um, Tom, uh, is there any risk to having repeated MRIs? You indicated obviously you're not getting radiation, but if you're in some ideal world and you get to scan patients as often as you'd like, is, is there a potential risk to an MRI? Um, we say no. I mean, uh, unless you are... The, the, the only risk is, is something that we would call specific absorption rate, which, which only really happens um, if you're in the scanner for many, many hours at a time. Um, but you're, you're more likely to receive more ionizing radiation from any other type of imaging or in, an international flight, for example. So, so no, um, I would say that there's no risk in doing the type of research that we're interested in. Um, yeah. That's good to hear. Um, one question sort of related to the, uh, perhaps to the uh, relation of BMI to fast progressing. If um, patients struggle to eat perhaps with bulba or they're coughing, et cetera, and they, their appetite's really suppressed, can that then induce a, a more rapid uh, disease sort of development progression in your experience? Yeah. So like, like everything, it, it's, it's complicated. Okay. So the statistics that we have, the first statistics were about body, body mass index that you brought to the disease. Then there have been studies of caloric supplementation and it does seem to be beneficial to have caloric supplementation. But, you know, you really need huge numbers of patients to prove that an intervention like that is of benefit. We, we know, we've always known that, that people with MND have a poor appetite. In our clinic, you know, when we first started, which is 20 years ago, we'd say, oh, look, you know, patient autonomy, if someone's not hungry, you know, it's okay not to eat, don't, don't pester them, you know, to, to the partner. We now have a different view and we say, look, you know, nutrition is important and, and we, we do think it's a good idea to try to have good nutrition, which particularly means caloric intake. But it's, you know, it, it, it's all of these things are, are kind of marginal. When, when, we, when we talk about things that lead to longer survival, you know, it, it's not arresting the disease. And um, we, we try not to be too over the top with, with any advice people have to do what's what's most comfortable for them but but certainly you know the view at our clinic for for many years is that nutrition is important and if possible you know eating even if you're not really very hungry is is probably good um, that you know with with bulba function that leads to the whole question of a peg to to help assist feeding but again we're not um 
you know, we're not forceful about that. It's it, everything is a very personal decision, and and what I said at the beginning, patient autonomy is really very important. People can choose what they want to do, but but yes, we we think nutrition is important. Okay. Um, another question uh, for Tom. Uh, we have. Uh... Uh, one of our uh, viewers here who's in the Apelis or the Meridian trial. Can you also get involved in your study if you're already involved in another trial or, or study? Um, I would get in touch with, if you can, just get in touch with us um, and we'll be able to go through that um, with you. Um, but at this stage, I can't see any reason why not. Um, yeah. Um, but yes, please get in touch if you'd like to, to know more information about the study that we're um, doing. Um, and we should be starting scanning probably in the new year, um, which will be uh, trying to recruit as many people as possible. So um, people with uh, the whole spectrum of MND. So we, we don't want to limit it to people just with ALS, for example. We want people with um, any range of diagnoses. So, yeah. And you're not tied to uh, people being referred by any specific doctors, like you don't have to be associated with UQ or obviously... No, um, no. Geography plays an issue, especially at the moment. Yes. Well. Yeah, especially at the moment. Yeah, uh, we are hoping. I mean, yeah, it's blue skies. Uh, if we can get people from interstate um, within, uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a few years to do this research, and we're hoping to get people to come back for multiple scans. Um, so yeah, we are hoping to get um, people from all over. And um, there is some talk of having um, sort of travel fees discounted or, or helped with eventually. So um, yeah. I'd watch this space, I would say. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, uh, in relation to the gut microbiome, uh, uh, any do you recommend probiotics at all at the moment, or uh, do you, no, I guess? No, no, I, I don't recommend probiotics. Um, they're, they're not so much in MND, but there, there have been trials in other diseases of probiotics which have invariably not, not been successful. Um, there are other ways of manipulating the gut microbiome and the most important determinant of the gut microbiome is diet. And the best diet for a healthy microbiome is actually vegetarian kind of a diet. Then there are other things called prebiotics and postbiotics, which, which are related to, remember I mentioned the, bug, the bugs make molecules that are good and bad. And the, um, the, the, the first molecule that was shown to be good was actually acetic acid, which of course is vinegar. So there was, there was a, this, this all came out of the immunological literature. And it certainly seemed like those people who drink a glass of vinegar every day might have been kind of onto something. The next molecules that have been shown um, are propionic acid and butyric acid. And there, there are trials of using these things, which are not trying to um, change the actual bugs there. It's trying to replicate the good things that the bugs do. The, the, the problem with the probiotics is that... Um, to, to a large extent, we think having a, a very varied gut microbiome is good. You want some of everything there so that, you know, they can all grow up and do what they need to do. Probiotics, to some extent, are, are trying to pick the winner and trying, trying to pick which, which microorganism is, is the good one. And as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of trials in other diseases where probiotics were attempted and and that didn't quite seem to be the way to go. So for all of us, it's, it's a healthy diet. And it may be that these prebiotics and postbiotics and things like, you know, acetic acid might be a kind of quick way to replicate some of these things. But the answer is, like, like everything in medicine, um, if, if we're not sure, it's, it's better to to avoid any extreme. So you certainly, you know, we know which is the good bug, you wouldn't want to try to pick the good winner. And if you don't know which is the good bug, you wouldn't want to, you know, try to restrict the diversity of, of the microbiome. So, you know, it, it, it's a way to go yet. Do you, um, I mean, obviously at this point it's too early to say, as you said, good or bad bugs. 
But do you have an, uh, a feeling for the kind of uh, the quantum, the size of the effect the gut microbiome might play? Do you think it plays a significant part in disease? That if you do find the the, the perfect yeah. microbiome, can it make a big difference? Yeah. Yes, I I I would think that in in MND it's going to be a lot of small things, you know, a bit, bit from this, bit from that. I, I can't see any single big um, intervention that, that's going to cover everything that we need. I think it'll be a bit from here, a bit from there, you know, a bit better nutrition, get, get the bugs right, um, see, see if there's anything that can be done, you know, to the immune system, check, check environmental things. I, I that, but that's just my personal hunch. I think it's complicated and I think, you know, we, we think it's a multi-stage process. Lots of things are happening. Once you get the disease, all of this variability needs to be accounted for. And I think, you know, there the, the may be, you know, I think there was a switch for everything I mentioned, you know, genetics, environment, you know, we've got to flip the switch in the right direction for, for many different things. But that's just, just my kind of feeling. As you can. Um, Tom, so uh, assuming then your, your studies progress to the point where you can identify different sort of disease states or different forms of disease, can you then start using that as a biomarker and use it to maybe identify early treatment effects? Is that, is that a, a, an aim, an ultimate aim? Um, for our study, not, not as yet. I mean, that is kind of the ultimate goal for a lot of the studies, but for ours, I think just characterizing these these different groups is is one thing that hasn't really been looked at too much. I know a lot of people, um, a lot of people living with MND are not even um, allowed into a lot of these studies because they have gone outside the the initial five years um, of survival. So one of the the main aims that we wanted to um, sort of have for this study was to incorporate. Um, well, I guess the heterogeneity of the disease is to have all of these different people see what the differences are and see if we can actually measure something with um, sort of more high fidelity scanners that we might be missing uh, on clinical scans. Um, so yeah, I guess biomarkers, blue sky, again, yeah, we would love to be able to create or have some biomarkers for the disease. Um, but at the moment, we're, we're more interested in just characterizing differences um, and understanding the, the different um, stages of the disease as well. Um, and whereabouts is the second T7 scanner? And are they doing any MND studies? Uh, in Melbourne, and I believe they are. Um, so we have exactly the same scanner down there. Um, I'm not exactly um, caught up on what they're up to. I know they do MS research, um, quite a bit of MS research down there. Um, but yeah, uh, we do know that they have one. And yeah, it would be great uh, if we could link um, between the two the two centres, and that would make um, travel a lot easier for patients, obviously, if they're in Melbourne. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, there's obviously uh, been um, a few uh, sort of suggestions from Richard about various chemicals or toxins in MND, blue-green algae is one, uh, well, the BMAA, I think it is, and then uh, even uh, sort of chemicals in military and Using to treat sports fields, etc. Uh, have you any uh, thoughts about uh, about potential those environmental toxins in MND? Uh, that's a very broad question. <laughs> that's a very broad question. Yeah. All right. So, so as as Gethin knows, um, we 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 know there are these external toxins, and we think that. So the blue-green algae account for some clusters. Epidemiologically, sometimes there have been clusters that have been linked to these blue-green algae. We know that there are clusters, for example, um, people exposed to formaldehyde in, in their work. That, that is a risk factor for getting MND. But I don't think those, you know, they obviously don't apply very widely. The question is, are there, are there things that more people are broadly exposed to, which we don't have a great handle on at the moment. But, but work that we have been doing has been looking in the blood of patients with MND for, for such toxins. 
And we have found um, increased levels of formaldehyde, increased levels of molecules related to BMAA and some other toxic molecules. And the question is, where, where have those molecules come from? We actually suspect the most likely thing is that they have actually come from the gut microbiome. So, so these molecules that, that are toxic to neurons, um, there are transporters that can get them from the gut into the blood and there are transporters that can get them from the blood into the brain. So, so I guess that's the angle we've been going down. To come back to Gethin's question, you know, you know, what can we conceivably do about the environment to, to help people? Um, I, I guess the answer is watch, watch this space because we haven't got any really good suggestions at the moment. Another, another thing that I didn't have time to put into my talk, but which is also important, is the whole role of what we call in medicine concurrent illnesses. And um, the, the important one is diabetes because diabetes is heavily related to metabolism. And as a matter of fact, having type two diabetes seems to be protective against getting motor neuron disease. We're not too sure about the outcome, but that's a whole world that we haven't really explored a lot yet in the MND field, the role of concurrent illnesses. And we also haven't really explored what might be called the prodrome stage. So if it's a multi-stage process, at some stage, there's enough death of motor neurons for a patient to have some symptoms that, that would be sufficient to present and be diagnosed. But in the prodromal stage, there are things going on. Um, the, the, one, one of them is weight loss, but the other is the um, cramps and fasciculations. And some people, seem to have cramps and fasciculations for, for maybe even for years before, before the weakness comes. And if we could identify people at a, an earlier stage, during that prodromal stage, that, that would be a good thing to target. We, we, we know we can identify that in people with a known mutation, but in people who don't have a known mutation, maybe eventually we will be able to recognize things maybe earlier, which would be the ideal thing. And then, you know, if there's a range, a little bit from here, a little bit from there, interventions. But to come back to the question, Gethin, about the environment, I, I don't think I have any really suggestions as to where we're going or what we can do about that. You know, obviously we, we don't want lead poisoning because that's not very good for your motor axons, you know, the, the ordinary stuff. Um, it, it doesn't really seem to be particularly pollution, though. Um, you know, if, if anything, rural residents seems to be worse. Pe people in more rural environments seem to be more likely to get MND than, than people living in urban environments, as far as we can tell. But, um, you know, that's a huge field to, to get enough numbers to make pronouncements in epidemiology. Mm. Oh, thank you, Pam. So uh, just a couple of very quick questions to finish up with. So um, uh, there's a very unfortunate case here. One of our viewers has commented on his uh, wife had advanced bulbar palsy, then a late onset brain tumour. Would there be any link there at all? Or is that just pure unadulterated bad luck? Yeah, we, we, we would think that they're not related. We, we do get patients who have MND and get lung cancer or MND and get breast cancer. And as you, as you get older, these, these things happen. We, we don't think that they're related. Mm. And a final question is um, another comment here about a brother and sister that had the uh, genetic uh, form of MND, mm. but one had upper and one had lower limb disease. Does that suggest they had two different forms? Or di Yeah, so, so, the, 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 so, you know, I, I flip flop a bit. Sometimes I think we should look at it, bulba onset as a different disease from spinal onset. But, but you know, just in the clinic last week, I, I saw a man, he had bulba onset and his brother, obviously with the same genetic background, had limb, limb onset just a few years ago. So you would think if the gene determined the site of onset, that then people would have the same site of onset. 
So that's an argument for some kind of um, ra random chance where it happens to start, but that's really not a very satisfying explanation for, for, for anything scientifically. But we, we too certainly see that, that, that people in the same family don't all have the same site of onset. So something, something else is going on. Just more uh, additional complications, unfortunately. Okay, well, thank you for uh, answering a, a barrage of questions there. We very much appreciate that. Um, just to finish up, just to say, obviously, a, a really great thank you to both Pam and Tom for uh, fantastic talks about um, two sort of uh, ends of the same, uh, the same challenge. Um, everyone who dialed in tonight, you'll get a, a link to a recording. Um, obviously, please feel free to distribute this across your network so everyone else can uh, really appreciate the fantastic research that Tom and Pam are doing. Um, if you want to go back and look at some of our other state of plays, you can go to our website now, mndaustralia.org.au. Go to the research link, and under that, you'll find the news and update section. We'll have all of our recordings, including this one as well, if you want to go and uh, see some of the other research that um, is going on in the MND world. Um, so I think that takes us uh, to the end tonight. Um, oh, I'd also like to mention that uh, for those of you who uh, seen that we were going to be hosting an MND Research Australia meeting with Fight MND this year, we've decided to push that back to next March so we can actually have a hopefully a face-to-face -face meeting now that it seems that we'll be opening up uh, end of October, November. So we decided a face-to-face -face meeting would be great. We'll still be running an MD Connect session for uh, the community.